good to be together this morning. And as we continue looking at the temptations, the issues that we fight and wrestle with, we come to this um, temptation, this um, emotion of jealousy. It's interesting, this is something I'm sure most of us, we probably most uh, quickly and immediately associate just with children, which is it's very, very common, it's very easy um, to allow ourselves to come to that place where we're just still learning to um, understand uh, levels of fairness and, and how sometimes just life isn't fair, and that's a hard thing to, to learn, that sometimes no matter, no matter how hard we try, no matter how hard uh, we, we, we seek to achieve things, some people just have better ability, and it's so hard, very, right, as children sometimes they're trying to wrestle with, but also we need to recognize, and that's where we find this particular issue, is that even as adults, it, it really doesn't stay just as children, it's still something that um, as we grow and we develop, we still will find ourselves being, being tempted or being uh, in a moment of wrestling with, with thoughts of these and can very easily um, pop into our hearts and our minds and something that we need to continually watch out for and watch that Satan doesn't manipulate it to the point where it leads us to very destructive things um, and keep a hold on it. It is, it's, it's amazing how, how easy it is, especially as we look at this occasion of Daniel I think his situation, I think, capitalizes and highlights why it is sometimes easy for us to get jealous. Daniel did not have to try very hard to get to where he was. Daniel had what we call natural ability to say, well, maybe he was just born with it. You know, what was, what was that clip? Maybe she's born with it. Well, he was. God gave him this special, unique ability. And so right off the bat, these individuals, no doubt, had been trying to develop themselves so hard to get to this place in the king's palace. All of a sudden, here comes this outsider who just has this natural ability that the king recognizes and excels him into these positions, and they are just literally eaten over. Like, how, how dare, how, how can this be? How can he be the one who has all these, uh, these abilities? He's talking, again, it's interesting. And they tried, they tried, they tried to find some imperfection. They tried so hard to just point out that maybe he's not as perfect as what he seems to be. And they said they couldn't. They couldn't find a single thing to discredit him or to point out that he was flawed in some way. And, and I think we, we, we all we struggle with this. I, I know for me, it's that, you know, anytime you're, you're, you feel like you're, whatever you have to try so hard to attain, and some people just naturally do it. I remember meeting a friend in college, and he literally, he never had to open the book. He, he never had to study, uh, and he would excel in his academics, and he would get A's on the tests, and here we are thinking, I'm trying so hard to keep up and could barely uh, get passing grades, and, 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 and you just get it so, so honestly. Uh, I know, when we, right, we talk about, I've heard different amazing stories of people, we've seen them, right, people just pick up any instrument doesn't matter what it is, they just have this natural ability to just excel in it. Um, I, I don't understand that, but there's people that just are, have that ability. And right, when you're making it your ambition to write to excel, and that's, that's your thing, that's, that's what, what drives you, is you, you want to be a good musician, you write, come across these people who just, they, 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 they get to levels faster and easier, <laughs> and it's just so hard, like, oh, how can it be that easy? I'm trying so hard to get even to where you're at. And so we do. We, we, we have these things. And these things are laid out in the scriptures for us. Obviously, even as we see the apostles wrestled with that of individuals that maybe just got understood things maybe a little bit faster than others. That happens. And so people are trying to get to these, these levels. Um, I know I, I wrestle a lot with that in my, my uh, brother-in-law. Uh, Colin, Beth's brother, we, we, we both have a, a love for barbecue so much that we'd like to try to make it ourselves. And uh, I've, against my best efforts, I guess I'm capable of providing burnt offerings, I guess at this point, if that's necessary or helpful. But my brother-in-law, it's like he didn't even try. And just like everything else I've ever heard and seen about, he's one of those guys, he never played basketball all day in his life. And he got to high school and someone put a basketball in his hands. And he's playing for the high school basketball team. He's just one of these guys. He just naturally learns things and just has ability. And this is no exception. He decided, I want to try to get into barbecue. I remember it was over at his house. We made barbecue for us. I'm eating it. I'm like, 
This is so good, but I'm so mad at you. <laughs> because how can you do it so easily? He doesn't even been doing it, I think, for maybe a couple times. And I just, uh, I'm obsessed with it. And I, I, I'm not even making, breaking ground yet. But I keep trying. But that's, that's, I think, initially how essentially we really, it really gets to us, right? Those times when it just seems like, just not fair <laughs> that this is just so easily accessible to you and I'm just, you know, barely making strides and, and it very easily hits us. Um, reminds me, actually, you know, introduced it. There was a story of someone who struggled with it so much and this is where we have to watch out for us. This is where we have to watch out for We don't let it take hold in us to such a point that then we, we, we let it um, burn in our, our minds to the point where it affects our relationships, it affects our ability uh, to be at peace with others. And that's for, we're, we're, we want to watch out for that. Watch out that this doesn't grow to that point that it, it becomes that disruptive. It reminds me of a story I'd heard about um, someone who is, who is um, struggling with this. And, and as the story is told, um, they were same, eaten up by, by jealousy. There was somebody in their life that it just seemed like no matter what they did, if it was sports, if it was, um, you know, anything else, uh, uh, academics, um, careers, whatever it was, this guy just always was above him. It always got to places easier and faster and better than he did. And was just really just, just so eaten up by it. He couldn't sleep sometimes. He just couldn't eat because he was so just consumed and thinking about it. And the story goes that one time there was... I guess uh, an angelic being from heaven came, came to, to talk about this and try to help them understand that they were just going to have to learn to deal with this. And as the, the story goes, said, well, I'm going to try to help you understand to this degree. I'm going to give you an opportunity to have anything you've ever wanted. Consider this an opportunity for you to kind of let go, let go of the spirit of justice. I'm going to give you anything, anything you want. I'm going to give it to you, but I'm also going to let you know that whatever you ask for, I'm going to give twice as much to this individual that you are consumed with jealousy over. Just so you recognize, you're going to have to learn to let it go. And as the story goes, the individual thought about, what could I ask to be blessed with that this other individual would get twice as much? And he said, make me blind in one eye. And he <laughs> goes, show me. That, that's where we got to the point where he just couldn't even be happy with anything until he felt that the other person was going to be hurt and, and, and brought down in some way. And that's where we need to rush it. That, that's what Satan will do. Satan will, will take those thoughts and crank the machine in our heads and our hearts and our minds to get it to that point where we, before we know it, we, 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 we've crossed the point of no return. One thing we're going to point out that's interesting as we look at a study of just the word itself in the Bible can sometimes be confusing because jealousy is not always spoken of in, in bad terms. Um, in fact, one of the characteristics of God is that he is a jealous God. In, in Exodus chapter 20, um, we look at this description of God. Jealousy is actually something that describes um, the nature of the God that we serve. In in Exodus chapter 20, and as we look at some of the things that, that he, we find about his character, of why he's given various aspects of the law, and we see in Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 4, it says, You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth, beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. So when God said, I, I'm, I'm a jealous God, that is, that he has such a desire for our affection, he wants it exclusively all consumed, aimed at him. And that's not really... A bad thing um, that's actually good to have that eye. Notice the mindset is that we would have such a desire that we, we, we can't allow for our desires to be split or shared. Um, right? That's one of the things when we talk about sharing, and that's what really helps us uh, uh, break that, that 
that, that thought of, of jealousy, being able to be someone who shares, who can um, see multiple people being uh, divided up into various places and we're all sharing parts of it with, with God. It's very different. He says, no, it's actually for our good that we'd be so overly consumed with a devotion to him that we will not share it. We will not divide it up. It will be exclusively aimed at him. And we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and Paul also gave the same idea that Paul recognized that there was a godly jealousy or a, such a devotion that we would be devoted towards the same thing. There would not be a sense that we um, can share it or divide it up, that we would all just be so consumed by the single-minded sense that we would want nothing less and that we would not accept anything less than full uh, zealous devotion in spiritual things. Notice the second Corinthians chapter 11 and, and note in verse 1 he says I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness but indeed you are bearing with me for I am jealous for you he says with a godly jealousy and what he's speaking about is he's saying that it seemed that their interests were divided, that they were almost sharing their heart, not only with spiritual things of, of God, but also they were allowing it to be spread out and divided up in other places. And he says, no, I, I, I'm jealous that, that, that you, would, you would not share that, that you would not split it up, that we would not see it divide up in other places, that just exclusively in this area, because we recognize that nothing is more important than our souls and nothing is more vital than being able to be with God for all of eternity in heaven. So says, I'm jealous for you that you would not allow your, your, your interest to be so divided, but we would be exclusively centered and that you would want nothing more and nothing less than just, just this. He says, and I want that for you, and I, and, I want, and I have this jealous desire that we all, as brothers and sisters in Christ, will be united in this. And so he speaks in those terms. He says, for I, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. He says, but I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led away from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And one of the reasons, no doubt, that Paul was saying, he says, I, I have this godly jealousy for all of us that we would be single-mindedly devoted exclusively to a spiritual devotion in our lives is because when we, we do divide it up, when we do allow certain places in our heart to be affectionately um, attached to this world, that's really where jealousy comes in. It comes in where it finds that weakness, right? That place where we have. We, we have our affections here and we have certain ambitions. And when we allow for those ambitions to almost be as equal in fervency as what our ambitions are for spiritual things, when we can very easy, right, allow the temptation for earthly success, uh, physical things that we can measure ourselves and compare ourselves to, all of a sudden becomes something very vitally important to us. And so really being jealous for spiritual things is a way to try to almost circumvent this aspect. But it's even interesting, even in spiritual things. It's, it's not limited. I read spiritual things. We can very easily allow that to creep in. That even when we're saying, well, no, I'm, my mind is set on, on spirituality. But even there, right, when we see others who, who grasp concepts easier or better, they, they excel in their faith better uh, or, or fat faster and even there if we're not careful can um, be tempted to allow this to affect how we look at those around us and so here's where we need to be careful of the temptations is however the casting grudging looks towards the success and the praises of others is something that we're warned to be careful about to watch out for that temptation to let it consume us to the point that we can't look favorably and instead of being happy and blessed and, and being able to compliment, right? Sometimes that's where we see sometimes, right, that issue like, well, I'll, I'll compliment, but, but, but through these 
these teeth that are clenched, and I'll, I'll say I'm happy for you. <laughs> and, and we're trying to mask it, right, and try to hide the fact that it's really hard to offer that compliment. That's where we, we, we need to watch out that it doesn't um, affect our ability to just rally around and praise and encourage and be thankful for the successes that others have, especially in, in their spiritual growth. But notice in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, um, we have... Uh, Verses that encourage us to watch out and be careful of this. First Corinthians chapter 3, um, beginning in verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. He says, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. Or since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And again, the, the irony of this is they would have argued, said, no, I'm spiritual. No, I'm, I'm all spiritual. We're, 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 just, we're just kind of uh, trying to compare some of our better spiritual teachers. And, but, well, that may be fine and good. And certainly there has to be an acknowledgement. There are just certain people that just, they're, they're better. Um, I, I myself remember so many times when it's like it'll be a sermon. You know, I've labored over it. I've, I've worked over it. I've worked over it over and over again. The the hours put into trying to fine tune it, right? And someone else comes along. And it seems like they just off the cuff just preached it, and everyone was like, "Wow, that was that was great." And it was a great lesson. But in the mind, you're like, "How? Well, that's not what they said to me. <laughs> that's not what what I was complimented with." That, that even in our, our endeavors to, 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 to be useful in the kingdom, we have to watch out for this. And that's where even in Corinth, it was affecting them that just because certain people were just, they were, they were better teachers. They were better preachers. And, but even though that talked about some level of skill, remember even Paul himself, he said, well, I may not be amongst the most best of the orators, that you know, maybe I might fall on a scale of 1 to 10, maybe I might rank 9 when it comes to maybe those who just can really give a, a great uh, spine-belling speech. But he said, again, we have to keep in mind that we're all just want what's coming out of that, the truth. We want to hear the Word of God, and we want to excel in understanding and obeying the Word of God. And just because we're human, yes, there's going to be those who obviously are better at communicating, better speakers, um, better at making their points more fluid, and even coming up with maybe illustrations that just seem to fit better and, and, and seem to help people just kind of connect. Say, yeah, I, that, that strikes a chord with me. I understand that now. And we have to be very cautious that when maybe so, it's somebody else who's doing that, that we don't allow that spirit of, well... Man, now, now I'm really upset. I have a hard time even telling them that they did a good job because we feel like we're comparing ourselves with what they are. And notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, there in verse 20. Actually, back up to verse 19. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 19 says, All this time you have been thinking that we are defending ourselves to you actually... It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all of your upbuilding, beloved, for I am afraid that perhaps when I come, I may find you to be not what I wish and may be found by you to be not what you wish, that perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. And, and it's interesting how all these kind of things all kind of merge together, kind of go hand in hand. Um, you, you really often will not um, be able to just isolate jealousy, it, it, especially when Satan is so good at, 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 again, pulling it out of us and pulling it to, to the point where we just have that hard time to, to join with the praises and join in the chorus of saying, yes, you did great. You did, that was that was. Wonderful. You, you just are, have a skill. You're, you're really good at that. Thank you for what you did. That if we can't allow ourselves to get there, unfortunately, all these other things seem to kind of flood out of it. The, the, the angry 
dispositions, the strife, the, the conflict. And before we know it, we're almost even picking conflicts that aren't even really there. It's just because it's spilling over from the angry and the bitterness and the jealous feelings we have that we just can't speak kindly. We just can't see how we can uh, support someone in their ability. And so it is something that really, it's, it's, it's almost something, especially when we get to adult levels of, of, of our, our growth, it almost becomes even more um, challenging for us to, to be cautious of this. Um, we see, again, several others that in their adult state of life, we're struggling with this. We see two brothers, Cain and Abel, where Cain just struggled so much with his, his brother Abel, Jacob and, and Esau, and we see how much there was strife over there, the, the issues that those individuals had, Joseph and his brothers, and on and on. We see so many situations in Scripture that hopefully recognize, we recognize, but, well, if it is something we're struggling with, well, we're, we're, we're in, in common company. It's, it's, it's a common temptation. It's common to man. Um, it's not something arbitrary. It's something that, yes, we all will, will, will need to humbly ask God for the strength to not let it turn into these destructive um, uh, ways of, of, of being against our brethren and against others. Let's take a, a lesson from the Godhead. I think it's interesting when we look at the fact that there are three persons in, in who we recognize as God, that there are different things and different tasks that each one accomplishes, and yet what seems to be the lesson for us is that what makes them one is that they're in such agreement that they support, they acknowledge the good things that each one does, and there is no, not a sense of, of competition among them. Especially when you consider Jesus. Consider Jesus was one. He's one of the Godhead. There's two others, the Father and there's the Spirit. Jesus came to earth, and Jesus was adored and worshipped when he was on the earth. Yes, he was at times he was rejected, yes, we see that there were times when he was spit upon, no doubt. But the fact remains that there were individuals that were able to give him praise and, and, and honor in a way where they recognized that, you mean, this is, this is God in a different form? It was a new way that they had never understood God. Think of this. God the F Father was the supreme mindset of the minds of these individuals on the earth. They knew nothing else other than just who God, the creator, was. Then Jesus comes and says, guess what? I'm God in the flesh. <laughs> and they start realizing, you know, the, the, the way that they, they bound before him, the way that they, rendered, who, when he controlled the wind and the sea, they said, who does these things? Well, we recognize that God, the creator, does. But specifically, they were attributing it to this man amongst them. He was the one being given this, this credit, that he was performing the things of God, even as a human being. And we see many examples of this. Notice in Matthew chapter 2. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 9, we see so many aspects of his life where he was adored and he was worshipped. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 9, it says, After hearing the king, they went their way in the star which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We need to make this distinction. This was not God the Father. This is a separate person. The, and it's something hard for us to, or, or, to comprehend this, but this was a separate person of God. Jesus himself, distinctly and individually, was being recognized as being worthy of these kinds of gifts. And remember, what didn't God the Father say, I'm a jealous God? Didn't he say, am I not a jealous God that I desire... All worship to come to me. We recognize that me includes the unity of all of us who are God. Isn't that amazing? 
When God says, I am a jealous God, it is not about individuality with God. When God the Father reveals to us that, yes, He desires jealously for us to be exclusively devoted to Him, He has us in mind. It is always a we, it is an us, be devoted to us together. And clearly shows us that even when Jesus is recognized by John the Baptist as saying this is the one that all of our sins will be washed away. This is the Lamb of God. None of us can be forgiven unless we go through Him. And remember amazingly to John the Baptist who believed, I need to be baptized by you. And ask John the Baptist to baptize him. And recognition that this is the one that will cleanse all of our sins. And what was echoed from the heavens from the Father? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God the Father is not jealous when it comes to the Son receiving gifts, receiving praise, receiving honor, receiving lips of sacrifice of praise and devotion as we do as we say we recognize it was not the father who shed his blood it was the son let's think about this only one aspect of the godhead was able to provide what is necessary for our sins it was the son and the father was not threatened by that kind of attention i do not have forgiveness by what the father yet the father provided the son but the Son provided the blood. He was nailed to the cross. It wasn't the Spirit. It wasn't the Father that was nailed to the cross. It was the Son who was nailed to the cross. And as we come together, as we honor, who do we remember? We remember the Son. We remember what the Son did. And the Father has no amount of jealousy that we are honoring that aspect of the Godhead. That's, that's amazing to me. Because that's the area where we, we are frail and we in our human state, we, we, we struggle with this. That as much as we want to have that we, that, that, that togetherness, we also have, right? Naturally, that individual, individual sense of attainment, of, of meeting our, uh, our, our goals and attaining things that, that, that make us feel worthy, that, that all of our hard work pays off and we see the results of it and we see the good that comes from it. And yet to refrain from being so individually minded in those achievements that we can't take a step back and see it's all about what we collectively as the body of Christ are achieving for the name of the glory of the, the God who loves us. But again, as we think about these things, again, turn to John chapter 9 and verse 35. John chapter 9, in verse 35. It says, Jesus heard them, that they had put him out, and finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. What is he talking about? What do you and I have to see? And remember, Jesus affirms, he says, As much as God the Father, and yes, they were all part, he says, We, the, he uses we, he uses the, the, the adjective us in Genesis. It's always us. But yet there is the creative element of what was in the mind of the Father. The Father is the originator. The Father is the, is the one who initiated all of this. It was in the mind of the Father that all these plans were, were calculated and put together. And yet, what does Jesus say? Jesus steps in front of the Father. In terms of two people who are equal, Jesus literally steps in front. What does he say? As much as the Father is needed, you cannot get to the Father unless you do what? Unless you go through me. Jesus initiated and puts himself in front of the Father and says, you have to believe in what I show you. You have to come to terms with my miracles. You have to come to terms with the things that I do. And the Father still says, this is my Son in whom I 
and well pleased. A jealous God is not jealous of the individual aspects of the Godhead. Amazing. There are times when parts of the Godhead have initiated that, that sense of, uh, of, of dominance, especially when we consider what Jesus was willing to say about the Holy Spirit. Again, the Father never seemed to be upset by this. The Holy Spirit never seems to get offended by this. In fact, think of the things that Jesus said that the Holy Spirit could do that he even couldn't do. Imagine this, all that Jesus said. And Jesus said, you have to believe in me. You have to come to me. You have to accept me. You have to be saved by me. And then you know what he says about the Holy Spirit? I can, we're talking about this, right? How frustrating it must have been for Jesus to try to get through to these apostles. He spent three excruciatingly challenging years. Remember, at one point, we, we, we feel his frustration. At one point, he says, oh, generation, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I put up with you? He said those words. It gets frustrating sometimes, <laughs> right? We understand that when we're dealing with anybody, right? We're, whether it's uh, uh, students, co-workers, right, family, whatever. We, it gets challenging. It's something we're trying to help understand, and there's, 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 we're just not getting through. Jesus had those moments. He said the Holy Spirit was going to do. The Holy Spirit would put it together. Jesus knew there was so much work he would do that they would never register. They would never understand. But then the Holy Spirit comes along. Guess what happens? Oh, <laughs> I get it. And Jesus never talked begrudgingly about what the Holy Spirit would do that he couldn't do. He said, I'm laying the ground, down the groundwork, but the Holy Spirit will help you remember it and help you understand it. That's not a great example of someone who did so much necessary work, but then praises the work of another teacher. <laughs> says, I love that that Spirit... And he says, if I don't leave, the Spirit can't come. Well, what, what was that about? He said, I want the Spirit to come because I need you to understand and grasp all that I spent my three years here trying to help you get that I know you'll never get it until the Holy Spirit puts it together for you. Isn't that amazing? Turn to John chapter 14 and verse 25. Among the things that I'm amazed by the humility of, of Jesus, this is one of them that his level of humility in saying, I am not begrudging or jealous of the, the great work that others in the Godhead will do, that oftentimes exceeds what they were able to do themselves. In John chapter 14 and verse 25, he says, These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you what all things. And notice, and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. There's some great things that happen. One of the things that happened says that there was when they were on the mountain of transfiguration. And they were having conversations, and it says that it wasn't until after the resurrection. Oftentimes it said that all of a sudden these lessons, these teachings, it said then they recognized after the resurrection certain things that Jesus had said. And the Holy Spirit was going to be vital in connecting a lot of these dots. So what an amazing example. Of course, contrasting that, we see us as human beings. And Haman is a good example, just a flawed human being, right? Who, who, it, when he was confronted with moments when there were those who who would not pay homage to him, who would not recognize his greatness, and he struggled with that. He said, I, I can't handle, I can't handle being around someone who doesn't recognize how great Haman is. And, and he struggled with that, being able to see that not everybody was entitled to, to, to praise him this way. What we need to strive for is to eliminate pride with true humility that will allow us to rejoice over the successes of others. Very quickly, just read a couple of passages and we'll end our lesson on this final note. But turn to um, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Jesus teaches us to follow his lead in this. 
in Philippians, the second chapter, notice in verse 2, Jesus, or Paul says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made of the likeness of men. Here's the other aspect of Jesus that I find fascinating here. It talks about his humility. You know, when we read about God the Father in the Old Testament, it didn't take much to convince people's minds that were skeptics of God's power, did it? How many times do you read people just being consumed with fire just on the spot because they didn't, they didn't recognize God? God didn't often put up with that, did he? God often, as he was a jealous God, often would reveal himself in so many instantaneous ways to say, you're, rest, you're messing with the wrong person. You're, you're challenging the wrong person. You have the wrong, wrong idea here, and I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to humble you immediately. Jesus was going to go to a cross and have to be humbled by being tortured before anybody came to their senses. You mean this was God the whole time? If there was ever a amount of jealousy, I would have to imagine it would be Jesus. You mean I'm not allowed to just go ahead and just consume him right now? Like the Father was pretty good at that. <laughs> Jesus has to take a more humbling, patient road. Jesus has to let people spit on him. Jesus has to let people humiliate him. Jesus has to let people misunderstand him and really nail him to a cross. Only to what? Well, I'll wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And then the Holy Spirit's work will hopefully make people put it together. They all had various different ways of working through this to get to us. And yet none of them seemed to have a problem with how very different roles were different. And some of them had to go through excruciating, painful, patient ways. One final uh, point I want to bring up. I remember hearing this um, a while back, and as I looked into it, it was really interesting. Um, just a great lesson about the beauty of, of us when we can master this and not let jealousy consume us, but, but through our humility and praise of others, so we can help each other work together. But in the 1964 Winter Olympics, there were these two fierce competitors the, the one on the left was from the British team, and the one from the right was from the Italian team. And they were very fierce competitors. They also happened to be very good friends. And as the legend has it, they were getting ready to do the two-man bobsled in the Winter Olympics. And both were highly favored to win the gold. Well, the, uh, the Italian team had already run their race, and it was pretty good. The British team went down their first run, and there was a bolt, a bolt that came dislodged from their sled. And they're very meticulous about all the requirements of your uh, apparatus, what you use there. If you don't have all the requirements, you're disqualified. Um, they would have been disqualified. And the Italians could have said, well, <laughs> tough luck, you can't, can't run your second race. Instead, the Italian man there to the right found out about it. He unscrewed the bolt from his own sled, you guys get up there and get ready. I'm going to get you guys ready to go. Ran up there, put the bolt on the guy's sled. And when they went down, they crushed the Italian's record. And they interviewed the Italian. <laughs> like, what, what, what happened? What's your comment on this? And he said, I want to make one thing straight. The British team did not win because of my bolt. They won because they were the faster racer. And he won a medal for sportsmanship. And it's a great, <laughs> a great lesson. Yes, is, is, is comparing ourselves good to, to, to motivate ourselves, to push ourselves, to see uh, may, maybe there's some things that I can improve about myself that I can gain from seeing those around us. Yes. But let's not, not let us consume us to the point that we can't rally for each other, that we can't support one another, that we can't see the good. And 
be unified in it. Let us take again a lesson from, the, from God himself and let us always see that it should be about the us and not so much about the me. But if anyone is here has never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to think about what you individually can do in, in your situation that the Godhead has provided for you. That the God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit have all worked together to bring the gospel to you. And we pray and encourage that if anyone here recognizes that they need to, yes, to go through Jesus Christ. You cannot get to the Father unless you go through Jesus. Once you humble yourself and confess that, yes, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and repenting, you will be obedient to that form of, of teaching he gave. Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And if you meet these conditions by faith, he will grant you that forgiveness of sins. If you need to do that, we encourage you, won't you come to the front? We'll gladly assist and help you become a child of God by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. While we stand and sing.